The phrase dead game can be quite an over-exaggeration, like when you're seeing somebody crying in general chat because they queued for a dungeon at 3am as a DPS, and the queue time was longer than 5 minutes. But what about MMOs that are truly dead? The ones that are still going but barely pushing the bottom of the population chart? I've recently been reminded about a game that I picked up from GameStation on the day of release back in 2011 called Rift. At the time I'd grown pretty bored of WoW and decided I needed to branch away from it. I remember it being quite an enjoyable experience experience with some features that broke the monotony of the level grind. I might be wrong but I don't recall many, if at all any, MMOs having so many dynamic world events from the get-go. Hell, the game even reviewed incredibly well across the board, scoring an average of 8 out of 10. So what went wrong? Well, honestly I wasn't around for that. I had already gone back to WoW, which now thinking about it seems to just be a never ending cycle that I probably won't break until I end up dying. But thankfully, Reddit user Elion, and sorry if I've said your name wrong there, wrote a two part post about their perspective as to why the game went into decline, stating that one of the biggest killers for the game was the lack of server transfers, as they weren't actually implemented into late into the launch cycle, his entire guild ended up quitting as there wasn't enough players on the low population server that they had chosen. Almost reminds you of something, eh Blizzard? Rift was also incredibly challenging, so challenging in fact that supposedly the player base couldn't really handle it as they weren't good enough. The game at launch also didn't have a dungeon queue system, and to be fair I know it's a touchy subject for a lot of people in the community, but I've always personally enjoyed them, and I can completely understand why a new player would consider this to be a negative in a game that has just launched when you've got your main competitor, which of course was WoW, who had a queue system in the place at this point for a couple of Xbacks. All of these problems aside though, this was pre-free to play, and Elion goes on to say that there was a huge influx during the Storm Legion X-Pack, which was also the time when the game director was experimenting with ways on how to monetize the game itself. Surprisingly, that wasn't the main cause for the exodus of the community. It was, according to Elion, that the barrier for entry was just way too high. The end game wasn't casual friendly at all, and it wasn't something you could just plug into, stating that for every 10 members they'd get in their guild, only 3 or 4 of them would actually make the mark. On top of that, as stated, there was simply no dungeon finder, so unless you were overgeared for the content, you weren't getting invited into raid groups. But there was also issues outside of the game itself, and that was with the game's developers, Tryon Worlds, who at the time were developing three major MMOs before one had even been launched, one of them actually being Arc Age, which no doubt took the Rift devs away to work on what was at the time one of the most highly anticipated MMOs ever launched. Not only that, but Tryon ultimately was acquired by German online games publisher Gamago. Who might you be asking? Well, honestly not a clue, but turns out they're a publisher who mostly put out free to play games with a particularly empty looking website, but according to their end of year report, the statement is that they offer over 30 MMOs and over 5,000 casual games. I'm not gonna lie, this website doesn't make it look that way at all. In fact, it's so barren that you'd be kind of surprised that they actually do have anything to publish, or even make any money for that matter. Now, getting actual numbers is incredibly difficult. I have heard that MMO populations isn't a particularly reliable source. But I'm going to use it anyway just because there isn't many trackers out there, and Gamago supposedly like to keep their numbers locked away, but according to most tracking websites, it really isn't looking good. The most accurate number we can really get is from the Steam charts, but the problem with them is that obviously not every player is going to be using Steam directly. They're just going to be booting through their own client, which is called Glyph. However, according to one source, 5% of Gamago's revenue for 2019 actually came from Rift. But looking at their quarter two report in 2020, which honestly, I am not entirely sure what I'm looking at here, but these look like particularly low numbers. And to me, low numbers, which let's be real, when you see low numbers, you think bad profit. According to their financial reports in 2019, Rift actually had a revenue of 2.6 million. In that report, it stated that more than 50% of the revenue that they're generating from the MMOs with monetization is solely generated by players who have been actively playing for more than five years, which completely makes every bit of sense because at that point, you would have seen everything that the game has to offer. Rift's main monetization comes from its in-game cosmetics, which are purchased with its premium currency simply called credits. You can buy mounts, costumes, and what they're calling convenience items. You can also subscribe to them and become a Rift patron, 
giving you increased experience, mount speed, currency, extra loot, more daily quests, access to a portable bank, guild bank and trainer, a 30 minute teleport, and wait, what's this? A priority queue to move to the front of the line when your shard is full. Gotta be honest, I cannot see that ever being used. You get an insane amount of stuff there, and really, anyone can immediately see its worth and the bonus in using it. You're simply at such a massive disadvantage if you don't buy it that, in a sense, it literally becomes pay to win, or at least pay to buff. I guess that would be a better way of saying it. And let's not, of course, forget about all of the packs you can buy, from the essential packs, which unlock six character slots rather than two, alongside 23 souls, and two of the bag slots for just a small amount of £30. And that's on top of the patron pack, which is a further £9.99 a month, which really is pretty standard. But let's also not forget that you have upgrade bundle packs for £44.99, the glory of the ascended pack for £75.99, fortune packs for £144.99, and the classic collector pack for £29.99. So in total, that's pretty fucking mad. The only bonus about any of these packs is that most of them will give you a 90-day patron pass. But still, if you wanted all the packs, it would cost you £296 just for the packs. Of course, I'd imagine a lot of people wouldn't even bother with the packs and just want to buy their patron pass. But even still, that's £83.99 a year. So really, it's not hard to see how it makes its money. But how many people are actually buying these things? Well, I don't really no. Unfortunately, there isn't really any way of getting that information on how much something's sold on Steam. And the only way to ever get it is if the publisher goes public with that information. But what is quite interesting though is that even though they boast to have thousands of games and 30 MMOs, it is a bit weird that there is only three games listed under Gamago on Steam itself. There's 22 items on there and three games. What a ratio. So what are these other games? Hard hitting big sellers where well, you've got The Witch's Apprentice, which is supposedly a magical mishap, which is meant to be about a young witch, her hard brooms, magical click management, and nasty, filthy ooze. And Trove, which actually has a really positive overall review score, calling itself the ultimate action MMO, which I kind of doubt, but sure, this is clearly a Minecraft clone but it is one of the games I've actually heard about. I don't remember how I've heard about Trove, but I've definitely seen it somewhere. In the grand scheme of things though, 2.6 million really isn't that much, especially if you compare the 100k per server on Final Fantasy and how many people must be buying stuff through that. And hell, even EverQuest in the state that it is today earned 10 million more than Rift. Surely you'd think that's not even enough of an earner for Gamago to even bother keeping the servers online. But let's face it, this is a company which prides itself on publishing so-called thousands of games. Quantity, not quality, is without a doubt their forte. The community are the ones I really feel for, though. It always sucks when you have an MMO which is on life support, and even more so when it's a game that I have fond memories of, unlike the Space Furry MMO, which was supposedly going to be the fucking infamous WoW killer. Just a note, by the way, I and as a little disclaimer, I haven't ever had any problems with Wildstar and honestly I'm kind of sad that I wasn't there for the Prime to be there hanging out with the boys exploring a new world together. A good MMO launch is always great especially when the game is met with long-term positivity but anyway fuck you dead game. Carbine Studios were not expecting Blizzard to Sudoku itself instead of letting another company do it for them but despite all of this I've decided to give Rift a go. I've been working my way to 70 for honestly not that long now mainly doing intrepid adventures, but before I get onto that, let's start at the beginning of it. Like a lot of MMOs, you have two factions, Guardians and Defiance, one being chosen of the Garden and the other being, well, Defiant. The character creation is pretty standard, especially for an MMO that came out in 2011, but hey, who am I to judge? They can't all be as good as Aeon, right? So, you've selected your faction. Now to pick your race. I went with a dwarf because, honestly, the rest of the races look pretty shit. After you've picked your race, you're immediately made to pick your calling. You can pick from four in the free to play, or if you've already purchased the packs, then you can play as a primalist, which obviously you have to pay real money for. There is a bundle with all souls, but that's all I want to promote about that. So once you've picked your calling, you can then pick a purpose, which I think that's quite a profound question. A purpose. Pick a purpose. The fuck is my purpose? I'm sat here reviewing a 10 year old dead MMO. A pick of different types of your class. Well, apart from the ones that you would have to purchase, but let's be real, if you're gonna roll warrior, why the fuck would you pay to be a healing bitch? Is this fucking Dragon Age? After some Jesus plot armor, you're immediately cursed with the most annoying tutorial you've ever come across in an MMO. <laughs> Use 
the WASD keys to move your character. Click a hostile target to it. In this mode, you can change. Soul Walk allows you to quick. You've participated in respawning, places your spirit. You have died. It's great that it's voiced, but holy shit, please let me figure out a few things on my own. It's just constantly popping up every step you take and you can't get away from it until you eventually find the setting just to turn the tutorials off. And if you've picked to play as a dwarf, well let me tell you Buster, you've just picked the race with the worst run animation. The movement for the best part is floaty, it took a long old time to get used to it in all honesty. It sometimes feel like you miss your mark on when to stop and I'm not sure if that's a server issue or the way that the game's designed. I think the movement in MMOs is the most important thing. I feel like WoW has got it perfectly down, Final Fantasy's got it pretty good, New World's okay, and that's all I can think about right now. Oh, and ESO. ESO is good. But you do find that with a lot of these free-to-play MMOs or even like Korean ones, they usually just feel a little bit floaty and the movement just feels a little bit off. But that's an entirely different video for another time. But speaking of server issues, if you're gonna play Rift, just be ready to be disconnected. This isn't the first time in the past few years that I've actually tried to get into it. But on my attempt prior to this, the server just kept going down and even now the lag sometimes can be quite brutal. Now no doubt that somewhere at the headquarters of Gamago there is a diesel powered generator outside of a garden shed that is running the highest technology servers according to the Witch Best Buy Guide 1987. But I will give it its dues. I did manage to at least have 40 minutes the other day without a bit of lag. One thing I see immediately as a huge positive is that some quality of life features, which are typically add-ons in other games, are already pre-baked into Rift. Now I can't remember if any of these features were already a part of the game at launch, such as swapping items directly from the slot and a completely customizable UI, but it's a welcome change. And it's especially a welcome change to not have to hunt down for loads of add-ons to add to it. However, it wouldn't have been amiss if they had added a DPS meter. The intro quests to the game are fit for purpose. It's really hard to say that they're good. They teach you how combat works, how if you pull too many mobs you'll get wrecked. Well, you will for now. Once you hit level 3 though, you get your soul tree. Your soul tree is just your talents tree, just like in WoW. It has three different sections, but these can be swapped out for different souls later down the line to mix up your build, and in fact it was one of the best things about Rift at the time, and the fact that you had your own class customization. No doubt there were certainly a lot of people min-maxing certain souls, but honestly, the freedom of choice like this wasn't really seen as much in MMOs, especially not when you compare it directly to Rift's biggest influence, wow. And this is something I genuinely love about Rift. It looked at the landscape of MMOs at the time and made a drastic step in the way forward as to how people can approach leveling. Now, I'm in no way sure if Rift were the first to do it, so please don't come up in the comments section getting really fucking mad at me because I didn't know about an obscure Korean hentai MMO that did it back in 1998. Rift, once again, for as far as I'm aware, introduced the idea of permanent world events. Just like its namesake, Rifts pop up everywhere. They break the monotony of general leveling and give you the opportunity for a challenge alongside hunting down elite parties. These systems, when I played it back on launch, were some of the most enjoyable moments I've ever had in an MMO. And played a necro build because why the fuck wouldn't you? Don't question that I didn't in this video, I always roll necro whenever I play Rift, so I just wanted to do something different for a change. And I guess that answers why the fuck you wouldn't want to that I literally just stated. But it's also very clear that the Rift devs had played the pre-Nax event and thought this is really good, let's make a game about it. So let's talk about skills. Now, skills act very much in the same way as they do in every other RPG. You level up and you get new skills. Most of them will come from your talent trees and this is all grand until you see it, legendary skills. Now, this supposedly isn't a pay to win item, but it did come from an expansion, Starfall Prophecy, and characters receive their first legendary point once they reach level 66, with one more for each additional level going up to the max of five at level 70. Only a few abilities in each soul can be made legendary, adding additional strength such as greater damage or another effect such as a stun. Now fair enough, this sounds pretty cool. You can buff a skill, you can evolve it into something better. Until you realise that every single spell does exactly the same as each other and Rift can throw a fair few spells at you. At least it feels that way when you'll typically only be using an incredibly small handful. Again, it's just more quantity over quality. And no doubt these spells become better when you're actually using their legendary versions, but why do they do absolutely nothing but basic attacks? I don't get it. Surely the leveling process in any RPG is for you to gradually learn your spells and the best rotations for them. Well, not even the best, just 
so you know your class, and not to have a shitload of pointless spells that don't become viable until late game. And it's stuff like this, whilst this isn't particularly a pay to win system, but I just can't understand why so many people play down the pay to win in this game. And it's just absolutely insane to me, you can literally buy gear, fair enough, said gear is a tier below, but it's still the fact that you can do it, and you're still going to be at an advantage to somebody that doesn't. So anyway, back to the quests, and once you've made your way through the kill, 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 collect, escort, kill, escort, talk to, run, cleanse, is just rush the rest of the quests to get yourself to level 10. And I can hear you, don't worry, why level 10 you ask? What could be so special about level 10? Well, jump, tell us otherwise we'll clobber your bloody head in. Instant and intrepid adventures. What are those, I hear you cry? Well, they're the reason that the general population of Rift can seem like it's completely fucking dead because there is literally no reason to even bother with the main quest chain. General leveling and dungeon leveling. Although, as a note on the dungeon leveling itself, I'm sure the dungeons are great. I don't remember any of them from Vanilla Rift, but what I do know is that I was queued as a tank for nearly four fucking hours and didn't get a single pop, so take that how you will. So anyway, these two things are known as instant adventures, which appears to have been added a year after the launch of Rift in 1.9. Although from what little resources there seems to be, reading about it seems like it was different and focused more on zones that were more of your own level. But please do correct me if I'm wrong. As I said, there isn't that much information out there. But what I can tell you for certain is to not even bother with instant adventure. Honestly, it's okay. You'll get an almost instant Q pop, but not many people join it. I think the most I saw was four, and because it's an entire endgame zone, you take forever running back and forth to your objectives over a pretty decent sized map. Then you get your first mount. I was genuinely shocked that they let you have a mount. I honestly expected it to be behind a paywall. Like, They'd give you a mount, but the riding skill would be a patron subscription and a $20 target gift card. But no, here it is, the three. At least so it seems, because the rest of the mount prices are incredibly expensive, and this is only a 60%. But it is still better than nothing, and it is good that they actually give you this. So what's the difference between this and Intrepid? Well, there are closed instants, usually set in a dungeon or raid. I typically get the Hamonel raid, but I've also had the other one, which I can't remember the name of which really says a lot, but typically that'll have 10 plus people in it, plus an instant queue. A word of warning though, please do not get too attached to the group you're with, because if, or should I say when, you get disconnected, you'll find yourself immediately logging back in, but even though you were literally no time at all, the game immediately kicks you out of the adventure, which I imagine if you're running with friends could be really fucking annoying. And you know what I found after at least this time of recording being level 33? The Rift is a lot of fun. The combat is quite fun, it feels quite fluid, it's a shame that none of my spells are actually really doing anything different, and I hate to admit it, but these intrepid adventures, whilst a lot of the time is quite a steamroll, they really make the game into the shiniest turd around. I did find at this point that as soon as you start these, you'll get a lot of gold. Things that seemed like it was going to be a long and impossible task to gain all of a sudden became very simple and easy. You can very easily make 100 gold in an hour or so, which completely allows you to buy the most expensive bags and mounts directly from the store. And I'm genuinely shocked that the devs don't scale the gold amount that you can loot, dependent on your level. So let's talk about leveling speed. Honestly, it's a decent pace if you're going through the story. It doesn't feel like you're out leveling it too much, or at least it didn't until I started doing a lot of rifts. And that's the problem for me with rift questing. There isn't really any real reason to touch it unless you're incredibly invested in its story. And by leveling just by the story is going to end up with you having a seemingly socialless time. And I can completely understand how that's going to change someone's perspective of the game. And if you're already playing rift but feel burnt out with the sheer loneliness of it, then definitely check out the adventures. Oh, and I did forget to mention that not only is the leveling speed incredible in these, but also you get chests for every single objective you do. This shit has the chance to drop gear, and it's such an insane boost to your character. Which is one thing, before I switched to tank, I got this epic sword. I honestly don't even remember where I got it from, it just seemed to appear. It could have simply been from logging in because there is a login bonus for every day that you go on. But having it absolutely trivialized the game from that point on, and it was at such a low level. If you want a more slower paced, more balanced version of Rift, then don't accept any of this kind of gear and don't do any of the instance content. Speaking of trivialized, 
I know I touched upon the Patreon system earlier, but if you aren't subscribed to it, then you really are at such a huge disadvantage. And I'm saying this again as if it's like a fucking ad. I think it's a dog shit system to have, but clearly it is working for the devs. As well, I got it myself, because some of the stuff is just way too good to pass down. And there were some of the things that I didn't even mention earlier, such as the 40% boost to currencies, faster mounting speed, faster mount speed, less chance to be dismounted, bonus loot that you can also re-roll, 40% extra rep, free teleports, and one of the most important features that isn't even listed on the benefits on the Patreon Steam page is that if you do not subscribe to the Patreon, 50% of all of your profits that are made on the auction house are taken as a fee. 50% is absolutely batshit insane. And I just can't see that if you want to make any money in this game, you wouldn't buy that. The devs have taken these incredibly scummy benefits and bonuses that you get and have made it so that you simply have to. You have no choice because you're just going to be so fucked and so far behind if you don't. You're not going to be making the same amount of gold. You're not going to be leveling as quick. You're not going to be moving as quick. Your XP is going to take ages. Your rep is going to take ages. And there's absolutely no respect for your time as a free-to-play player. But why would they be? That's the whole point of the business model. So whilst this is incredibly scummy, it just makes sense. It makes sense for a company to be doing this because they know that people are forced to see this. They're forced to know, well, actually, well, I could be doing this quicker, or I could have more bag space, or I could be running quicker, or I could get the loot that I need. But instead of focusing on all that stuff, why not just focusing on making it a good fucking game? It's not like any of the other big MMOs, the ones that are super successful, like WoW and Final Fantasy. They don't give you these kind of bonuses, and they're doing fine. And that really fucking says a lot. I think it's clear how Rift is making its money, and it is through such systems. The endless stream of packs and reasons to buy the premium currency so that you get a heads up and buy some of the best gear in the game directly from the store. It's truly a sad state of affairs, a game that if it hadn't shot itself in the foot by being too inaccessible for the average player in 2011, has been completely reduced to what is essentially an RPG power fantasy in which you pay real money to unlock more bag spaces that is also slowly but surely drifting towards becoming abandonware and just being left to the void. Rift still has that potential to be something good, but there's no way in hell without a complete remake it's ever going to happen. And there isn't enough people who give a shit about this product. Now, as overly negative as that opinion is, I do still think it's worth giving a go. I think if you're lost about what you want to play and you want to see what something was like from 2011, then maybe look into different ways of playing. I'm not going to say specifically, but I'm sure you can figure out what I mean by that. There is a version out there, or so I've heard, that doesn't have any store. It doesn't have any pay to win and it's communities like that that really matter that are ensuring that you know, the integrity of something that a lot of people enjoyed at one point is still there and it's not left to just be a soulless husk of a cash grab and it's going to be like that until it eventually gets struck off the one of five thousand other games that gamico have and it's such a shame there was so much potential